Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Niantic Community Church, where whoever you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We offer a welcome to those worshiping in the sanctuary, which is pretty full today. That's pretty awesome. Also, those of you who are worshiping on Zoom and on Facebook Live, welcome to all of you as well. I'm so glad that you've chosen this house of worship today to join us in person or virtually as we gather to worship God. I'm Jeff Birch, the student pastor here at NCC, and it's my privilege to lead you in worship today. We are pleased to welcome back Richard Schenk uh, to the keyboards and to thank him and the dance choir for this wonderful prelude. <laughs> we, of course, continue to hold in our prayer our friends and siblings impacted by hurricanes and Fiona and Ian and also those in eastern Kentucky that are still, still recovering from the epic flooding last month. I know there are several announcements. Who has an announcement they'd like to share today? There's one. Thank you, Jeff. I'll move down front so you can see me. <laughs> I'm Verna Swan, and I am um, a, a um, emeritus member of the Dr. Martin Luther King Scholarship Board. Uh, I'm asking that everyone here support this wonderful, wonderful thing that we do for students who are not able to um, have monies to go to college. The scholarship is awarded every year, usually very supported by the businesses in the community. Uh, they give $20,000 scholarships. Wow. We had up to, uh, the last one was 12 young people that they helped. So they have not had in-person dinner since uh, 2019. So this is the first one since then. So this is the 41st dinner. Uh, I'm asking that Niantic Community Church members support, support this uh, organization by attending the dinner. Uh, the tickets are $75. If you would go on Google and you go Google Dr. Martin Luther King Scholarship, you can uh, purchase a ticket through there. I would love it if you let me know. That way I can have them to have a table with the church's name on it so that you will have a place. To, you won't have to sit with strangers, but sometimes that's nice so you get to meet other people. So, but it would be a wonderful support. And the church does still support the foundation by giving um, uh, funds to them annually. So if you do sign up, just let me know if you would like to sit at the table with uh, NCC. Thanks, Verna. Who else has an announcement today? Yeah. October 21st. October 21st. I'm sorry, October 20th. Thursday, the third Thursday of October. Others. Just a reminder that um, the Nahantic Nation peoples are having an event at McCook Point um, immediately, well, starting at noon. So you will have time to go hear Jason speak at 1030 and then come to McCook Point, and um, Dr. John Pfeiffer, who will be with us in November, will be leading a guided walk through the park. So um, the, there will be lots of activities for the children as well as for the adults. So hope you can attend. Thanks, Margaret. Any others? OK.
You can stay connected to all the great stuff going on here by going to our website, nianiccommunitychurch.org, and subscribing to the weekly newsletter. We're also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, so like, follow, or subscribe to us there on those platforms as well. There's a lot. There's a lot going on today. There's a lot that's been going on this weekend. The autumn seems to have arrived with a bang, um, and uh, so let's get to it. So join me now and center ourselves in the spirit of Christ as we prepare to worship God. And if you'll rise in body and spirit for the call to worship and remain standing for our first hymn. Jesus, have mercy on us. We need healing. Make us whole. Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, have mercy on us. Let's, con let's continue our worship by singing hymn 67, We Thy People Praise Thee. I was standing in back enjoying the music and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm on. <laughs> I'd like to invite the children forward. And I will say, anyone like sixth, seventh grade, if you are not comfortable coming forward and sitting up here in the spotlight, that is totally cool. But any children that we have, you're also welcome to come forward if you'd like. Any children? All right. I know a lot of our families are away this weekend with a holiday. Come on forward. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. So. <laughs> There's Iona. All right. Well, I wanted to share with you something that I do 
every night before I go to sleep. And it actually, I think it helps me sleep better. And that is a friend of mine years ago gave me this little three year journal. And you guys are like, it's a lineup over here. <laughs> well, anyway, a friend gave me this three year journal and every night you're supposed to, or every day, you're supposed to write one thing that brought you joy, that made you happy. And I tend to write more than one, um, but it's kind of neat. I was flipping through it the other day and on August 4th marked my five years of being here at NCC. So that was kind of neat to be able to remember that. Um, but so what I do is I write down something like on Thursday, the weather was so gorgeous. I wrote that down. Um, and some other things happened that I wrote down. And then, you know what I do? I thank God. I take some time. I put the journal down and I take some time and I just thank God for all the good that I experienced that day. And sometimes I lift up other prayers as well, but I make sure that gratitude is the main thing and it helps me sleep better and it helps me have a, a kind of a better attitude too. Do any of you guys, can you name something you're grateful for today? Yeah, Nick. The church. Yeah, very nice. Do you have something you're grateful for? What is it? Chocolate milk. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else? What are you guys grateful for? Chocolate anything. I'm with you. I'm totally with you on that. Chocolate. I don't know if there's chocolate downstairs after the service, but I hope there is. Yes, Ocean. About quilting. So Ocean was saying that that her neighbor had a yard sale and knocked on her door in the evening and brought her two books on quilting. That was really thoughtful. So let's join together in prayer. If you'd like, you can repeat after me. Loving God, we are so grateful. You created the world. You created all the animals and plants. You created us. And you called all of it good. Help us to see the good and to live with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go to Sunday school. Let's go this way. I'm used to having music playing. <laughs> this way. If the congregation is to sing Jesus Loves Me, as we first stepped out, feel free. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. stewardship theme, Many Gifts, One Spirit, is underway. I'd like to invite Phil Lombardo to come forward and speak for a few minutes on that. Many Gifts, One Spirit. The creation of the Memorial Garden is a perfect example of how this statement exists in NCC. 
Carolyn and I have been involved in the Memorial Garden from the beginning, and our experience certainly is a story of many gifts, one spirit. The Memorial Garden story starts on a beautiful morning during an outside church service down by Gordon Pond. Our previous church in Simsbury had recently established a Memorial Garden, and we discussed that this spot by the water would be a perfect place to sit and reminisce about a lost loved one. A memorial service here, and then a brief walk <clears throat> to this peaceful and beautiful place would be ideal for us. After some thought, we decided to see if we could make it happen. And we got Pastor John's support. We approached the Prudential Board and they gave us a permission to create an ad hoc committee to study the idea. The ad hoc committee was comprised of Sue Basham, Ron Diesel, Sue Smith, Craig Hope, Carolyn, and myself. This was a diverse group with very different personalities and ideas. However, the team used their many gifts of creative thinking, <clears throat> and when you have one spirit, you can get a lot done. The team went well beyond the original plan. They added the concept of a brick path with engraved bricks, and they had a plan to refurbish the neglected altar. The altar is another inspirational story. We discovered it was built in 1974 by a church youth group who also used their many gifts to build the altar stone by stone with a prayer attached to each one. I'm told the youth group leaders placed the Pepsi can in the hollow of the altar containing a prayer and label themselves the Pepsi generation. <laughs> The altar was then dedicated to all the hard workers in our church. Another one spirit story. <clears throat> we got the garden concept approved, but then we had to find funding. Our fund drive generated the sale of 101 engraved bricks and 20 pre interment contracts. Many gifts from a membership with a single spirit to build a memorial garden. We're not finished yet. We still need to make the garden more accessible. In that case, the many gifts came from the commitment of the Accessibility Committee, funding from the Endowment Committee, and the creative engineering skills of Keith Nielsen. The garden's doing well. It looks good. We have about 16 interments. With the addition of a bench, we have seen the garden used as a respite for a busy, from a busy day, a place for meditation or just some quiet time. The path to the garden's completion was not always easy. There were both opposition and support. The congregation talked, prayed, and supported each other on this journey with a common spirit. Right now, NCC's path is a bit uneasy as we look for a new settled pastor. So this is a time for us to find ways to focus on our single spirit. One of the ways to maintain the viability of the church is supported financially. Carolyn and I <clears throat> will continue our commitment to pledging, and we hope that you will too. Um, so to quote Jeff Birch in a past sermon and some redneck comedian named Larry, let's get her done. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Now Margaret will, will give us our scripture for today. Thank you, Phil. The scripture this morning is from Luke 17, 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. 
And as they went, they were made clean. And then one of them, just one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God. Thank you, Margaret. And I will read for you the Niana Community Church land acknowledgement statement. As we gather this day, we acknowledge that we are on land where Nihantic and other indigenous people first gathered, lived, and cared for the land. We give thanks for, these, for the strength and resilience of these early indigenous peoples. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and lament with humility the tragedies and inequities that befell them at the hands of early colonial settlers. Our history at Nyanic Community Church includes preaching by our first pastor, the Reverend George Griswold, to the Niantic people at Black Point, and our membership role in 1743, which included 13 Nihantic people. We recognize our responsibility to a shared future and pledge to care for this land and the land within our broader community with the same gratitude and reverence expressed by our earliest ancestors. As we move forward, we pledge to be in relationship with our indigenous community and with all peoples who have experienced injustice as we continue to learn to love, respect, and care for all as our neighbors. Amen. Will you pray with me for just a moment? God, as I've wrestled with your word this week, help me to express your vision clearly as you've expressed it to me. Amen. So my friends, today's scripture suggests two different sermons to me. The first is the story that Luke wanted us to get. And that's a story about gratitude for the grace given by God. The second story is about discrimination. Discrimination against others with disability and against others from a different ethnic background. Let's talk about both of those things today. I'll start with the second one first. And I'll begin that with a story. On the north shore of the Hawaiian island of Molokai is Kalapapa National Historic Park. The park commemorates the community of Kalapapa, which was a leper colony established in the 1860s to isolate people, mostly native Hawaiians, who contracted Hansen's disease, which we today know as leprosy. The disease was brought to the islands by Europeans. Even though a treatment for the Hansen's disease was first available in the 1940s, that order to isolate people affected with it at Kalapapa remained in effect until 1969, 10 years after Hawaii became a state. Kalapapa is remembered in history not just because it was a leper colony, there have been, and still are, many leper colonies. What made Kalapapa unique was the isolation brought by its geography. When one was moved there, particularly in those early years, 
The isolation of the place would mean that one was likely never be seen or heard from again by one's family or one's origin community. When the lectionary brings us to this story in Luke, we need to recognize we're not really talking about people with Hansen's disease. That's not what leprosy meant in those days. What we know as Hansen's disease did not make it to the Holy Land until centuries after this was written. In fact, the word that the New Revised Standard Version, which is the version that Margaret read from today, translates as leprosy, the Greek word lepro, which simply means skin disease or disorder. If you were to take that word in a context outside of the Bible, lepro would mean something like psoriasis. So we're not really talking about something that was necessarily contagious not something that was necessarily dangerous. It was something that made one look different. And like so many other things that made someone different from the social norms of the group, Jewish law had rules about it. So that's the first part of the sermon. And then there's the second part. The second part here is that on that day, of the 10 people that were healed, the story identifies one of them as a Samaritan. Now there's a long story about who the Samaritans were and are that might make an interesting topic for a faith forum someday. But suffice it today to say that the Samaritans were the ethnic and religious descendants of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, which had been destroyed over 700 years earlier. The traditional animosity between them and the Judeans had existed for centuries, and the very word Samaritan was used as an ethnic slur. So we've got two levels of otherness on display in this reading. We've got the level of otherness that refers to people with a skin disorder that makes them look different. And then we've got the level of otherness that's arising from an ethnic difference. And Luke uses both of these terms as epithets to describe two different kinds of people that his original readers would have assigned negative attributes to simply because he used those words. Now to be sure, the people who first heard Luke's gospel would have found none of that weird. They in that day did discriminate against people. Jewish law, contained extensive requirements about what to do with and for people who had skin diseases. You can, look at, you can look back at Leviticus 13 in your pew Bibles if you want to and read about it. It's a very long and very detailed chapter about skin diseases. Seriously, folks, don't go read it. <laughs> but that's what Jesus was telling them. Go and show yourself to the priests so they can proclaim you clean. That's what Leviticus 13 required. And that's what the nine presumably faithful Jewish people did. But then there's that tenth person who didn't go to the priest. Who was this guy? Perhaps he didn't know what Jewish law required. But even if he did, he didn't feel bound to do that first. For the other nine, they believed that they would not be clean until the priests said they were. They weren't clean until they were clean in the eyes of Jewish law. But this tenth guy, the Samaritan, believed that he had been healed by grace. He didn't need the law of the temple and the imprimatur of the priest to make it real for him. As Jesus would remind him, he knew that his faith had made him well. And he was grateful for it. As I said earlier, we know today that leprosy had not yet spread to the Middle East when these words were written. 
and certainly had not been there when Leviticus was written. So what did Jesus cure him them of? Psoriasis? Maybe. But I also think that Jesus healed the Samaritan and the other nine. And this is what I think is the point of this story, my friends. What Jesus healed them from is isolation and separateness from their respective communities. Jesus did not tell them to go away. He didn't tell them to keep their distance, although they did. These ten people in need of love and care and healing, came to a man who had demonstrated that he was willing and able to do precisely that and asked him for mercy. The law had already pushed them away. The norms of society demanded that they be isolated and alone so that they would not contaminate the larger societies they were born into. But Jesus offered mercy. Jesus didn't care which marginalized group society had assigned them to. He wanted only to heal them. He wanted only to heal them. But only one turned back and was grateful. Grateful for love, grateful for care, grateful for even being noticed. It was the Samaritan that returned God's love with gratitude. I'll circle back to that in a minute. Today, we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, so I want to spend some time talking about the Western Nihantics, whose land this is. Saybrook Colony was founded in 1635 by Puritans. So those of you who in the room who are identify as United Church of Christ like I do, I'm talking about our religious predecessors, the Puritans. Those Puritans founded Saybrook Colony, and by 1672, the Nehantics had been pushed into a tiny reservation on Black Point, a reservation not far from where McCook's Point Park is now, a place where this afternoon's presentation will happen. These people had already been decimated by smallpox, which had been brought by European settlers to this land and by war with adjacent native nations. The Puritan John Winthrop, the younger, in fact, thought that the smallpox that was moving through the area and killing the native population was the work of God in clearing the land for his people to move into it. My friends, that's horrifying. There, are barely, there were, at that time, barely a hundred Nehantics left when they moved on to the reservation, and eventually, even that was taken from them. All that remains is a sign and a stone memorial. By 1870, the Western Nehantics were declared extinct by the state of Connecticut, which then sold the reservation. However, a woman named, I love this name, Mercy Nunsuch. A woman named Mercy Nunsuch, the last living full-blooded Nehantic, was still alive at that time. Upon, uh, upon hearing of the state's action, she declared publicly, I am not extinct. Honoring the Nehantic nation, as we live and thrive and worship God here on their land is the absolute least thing we can do. My friends, there's so much to learn from this scripture today. In my short career as a preacher, few scriptures have given me so much pause as this one. Each of us in this room is pressured by society and also by our own human instincts to conform to a set of norms in order to be considered part of the community. That's necessary. We need rules and order and standards to be a community. And we need to be in community in order to survive and thrive in the world. But we needn't be erased by it. 
That is what Jesus helps us to see. Jesus didn't change Jewish law about skin diseases, but he did heal those diseases. He didn't make the Samaritans into Jews, but he did recognize and honor their humanity. Jesus didn't remove boundaries, but he did move boundaries. He didn't make the poor rich, but he did feed them. He didn't demand that we all contribute the same, but he did ask that we honor each, other, each person's contribution. He didn't demand homogeneity, but he did ask that we love each other. My friends, today, Kaolapapa in Hawaii is remembered not just as a leper colony, but also for the work of Father Damien, now Saint Damien, who was a Christian missionary who spent his life caring for the residents there. And I didn't get time to give Jen a picture of this so we could display it. But this was a Saint Damien's medal that belongs to a Catholic friend of mine who happens to be my partner in life. He was in Hawaii when, when Saint Damien was canonized. He worked as a Christian minister or Christian missionary who spent his life caring for the residents there. He eventually succumbed to the disease. Kalapapa started as a place of misery and isolation and became a community, a place where the love of God abounded. My dream for us is somewhat more humble than that, siblings. I dream that we can be a community where we honor our differences with the same energy that we honor our likenesses. A community that heals separateness with togetherness. A community that sees the one God in the many faces we have and the many stories that we share. A community that can learn from our history and hear anew the voice of the still speaking God. I pray that we are all of that. But for today, let Kaolapapa stand as a reminder to us. Let the meager memorials at McCook's Point Park stand as a reminder to us. Let our land use statement resonate in our ears and let the words of mercy none such ring from the rafters, I am not extinct. My friends, you are loved. You are loved. All of you are God's children, and you are loved. Praise be to God. Amen. <laughs>
I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gave blessed consolation That my trials come To only make me strong Here's the chorus to our time of prayer, I'd like to invite uh, those who are with us on Zoom or on Facebook Live to type the prayers that they have today into the chat or into the uh, discussion on Facebook. What concerns do you have here in the room today? Prayers for our family who left early this morning and for more family who arrives this afternoon. Prayers for traveling mercies for arriving and departing family. Others.
the prayer request cards, Nancy Burkhart is uh, is praying for traveling mercies for a granddaughter and uh, and somebody. Um, what's that? Family. And family. Thank you. Uh, traveling to Okinawa, Japan this week. Wow. Uh, we're praying for Thanksgiving for all the positive things about our church, especially the musical talents. Thank you for everybody. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Wendy and Bob Nielsen are praying for Marge and, uh, and Dick Frank. On Facebook, um, Sharon, um, Sharon is praying for Don, who's recovering from surgery. Are there any others? Ah, here's Ro uh, Rose is praying for the healing of a family member who had a recurrence of stomach cancer. Teresa is praying uh, a, a prayer of thanksgiving for Frank Chan as he leads our governing board as president. It was a tough year. Others? Yeah. Continued prayers for uh, those uh, people in Florida mm -hmm. and their recovery and for the families of uh, all that have been lost. Yes, prayers for all of those impacted by storms and floods and wind and politics. Prayers and thanks for such a meaningful sermon today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Christy on uh, Zoom is praying for friends and family who are ill in body and spirit. And Teresa praying for, for the immigrants. Yes, the ones who have yeah, they begin to become a pawns in our politics. So let us be in a spirit of prayer. God, you are our hope. Hope for the now, hope for tomorrow, hope for eternity. Your righteousness gives us hope. God, who is God, see us. See in us our hopes and dreams. See in us the person we really are. See in us the person we aspire to be. See in us the possibility of your glory personified. See us, God, and in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, who is spirit, fill us. Fill us with care of your creation. Fill us with love until we overflow. Fill us with passion for mission and care. Fill us with peace. Fill us, God, and in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, who is the word, teach us. Teach us to see beyond the visible. Teach us to be welcoming to all. Teach us to be expansive in our outreach. Teach us to be accepting of your truth. Teach us, God, and in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, God, those we have already spoken or written, and those we raise to you now in silence.
God, see us, fill us, teach us, make us your own. Amen. And now, siblings, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we'll sing our final hymn, hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. My friends, may the peace of Christ be with you.
please share the peace of Christ with the neighbors around you. Peace, peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. My friends, go now because the mercy of God has freed you from your past. Go because the mercy of God calls you forward into the world. Go because the blessing of mercy you offer to others will lighten the burden they are carrying. Go because by the mercy of God we are all healed again and again. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.